Good morning and happy National Healthcare Decisions Day 2024. Hello, it's Dr. G at the Heart of Healthcare. We are so glad to be here. We have an interdisciplinary panel uh, and we have the founder of National Healthcare Decisions Day, Nathan Kotkamp, and we are excited to make sure that everyone come 2025 knows about National Healthcare Decisions Day and that they have their advanced directives in place and have identified a surrogate decision maker. So welcome everyone. Okay. So what we're gonna do to start is I want to just go around. We'll start with Nathan, hello. Hello, thanks for having us. Of course. Um, and then we'll go down the interdisciplinary panel. So we have an RN, uh, Helen Bauer here from the Heart of Hospice podcast. Hello. Hi. Thanks for including me. This is a very intimidating, awesome group of people. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm the one who's sweating here, fangirling all of you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And standing in as our chaplain today, leader of chaplains, hello. I'm from Harbor Healthcare System. I'm working as a chaplain through Harbor Healthcare System. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then going to social worker and our friend, the co-founder of the Death Deck, Lisa Paul. Good morning. Hi, Dr. G. Thanks for having me. Of course. And another nurse, and my co-author of The Real Deal About Hospice and End of Life Doula, Sharon Harris. Hello. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And this is a lot. This is so exciting. We have a Medicare specialist and long-term care insurance expert here to talk to us about that type of thing. Christine Swisher from Giving Tree. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. G. Happy to have you, Christine Marquez, Christina Marquez, I'm sorry, uh, one of our um, hospice friends here in the community in San Diego. She is the director of business development for Shores Hospice, but she is a pulse specialist. Hello. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. I'm fangirling a little bit too at this group. <laughs> <laughs> and last, but certainly not least the person who runs the conversation project hello kate good morning good afternoon good evening to wherever people are calling in from lovely to be with you calling in this is like a radio show from back in the day right <laughs> i know i used to call in <laughs> all right nathan so tell us how you came about creating this day well, in the simplest terms, I had no idea what I was doing, and that was uh, both the blessing and the curse of it all. So let me step back just a smidge. Um, my day job is a uh, healthcare attorney. I do all sorts of regulatory stuff. Um, I practice in Richmond, Virginia, um, but I also have a master's in ethics. And when I went to grad school, I actually thought I was going to do ethics, not be a practicing lawyer. But within a few months of starting practice, I volunteered for several hospital ethics committees in the greater Richmond area. And I kept seeing the ethics cases pop up over and over again. And it was the same issue. It was end of life decision making with no guidance whatsoever. Uh, it oftentimes came in the context of someone who had um, a, an illness that was not like, you know, sudden and they all of a sudden landed in the ICU. It was heart disease. It was cancer. It was something where they were people who had multiple, if not years long interactions with the healthcare system. And the notion that they would have gotten to the point of their care where no one talked to them or no one had a meaningful conversation with them to elicit their choices about their end of life care was just, it was astonishing. It was appalling. And I just couldn't sit by and let it keep happening. So um, I started very small in Virginia with a Virginia Advanced Directives Day, and it was super, super successful two years in a row. We literally had 100% of the hospitals participating. And at that point, um, I really felt like I didn't have anywhere to take it than to go national. And so I just started 
calling as a relatively young lawyer who didn't know the difference and wasn't afraid to take the answer no. And I just started calling all the, the major organizations around the country. And um, we were sort of in the right place at the right time by a neutral person. So it wasn't one agency asking another, one association asking another, because there's a lot of historical baggage that those folks have. I was just a young attorney just trying to do the right thing and uh, look where we are today. I wish we had an applause button. Thank you for that. <laughs> so where do you, I'm hoping today that we're going to get down to the nitty gritty because all of us here, we work at the bedside sure. or in some other form. And we see a lot of stories where people, where we could have done a better job of planning ahead. And so that's why we want to be here to get down to the nitty gritty of of creating those advanced directives. So um, where do you see it right now? You know, I don't, it's been a few years and then where do you see it going? So first of all, I, I want to make a, a level setting uh, statement about what the event is or the initiative is. We really call it an initiative because um, there is no real organization. I mean, we are absolutely blessed to have the conversation project being uh, serving as like the host of what we do. Um, but there is no structure. Anyone who wants to participate can do it however they want, whether it's a one on one discussion or some sort of event for thousands of people and everything in between. The other thing that's super important to recognize is that there, there is really no agenda other than education and action. So for people who want nothing at all at the end of life or for folks who want the full court press, I don't care what their particular choices are. What I care is being sure that I know what those choices are. So hopefully setting that out there will help anyone that's listening to this who's like, well, I'm too small to do anything for National Healthcare Decisions Day or I'm not doing enough or I can't do something that big. You can do anything you want. And I, I will be there and everybody who's on here knows that they can reach me. Anybody can Google me. I will be delighted to have to help with any any ideas because I've seen a lot based on on the feedback that I've gotten over the years. So I'm, I'm always happy to support any kinds of programs if I can. Fantastic. Well, we're just going to go around and share something from each of our perspectives. Um, and I had initially initially talked about having a story of the day. And for listeners, I want you to go check out that movie on Netflix. It's called Queen Bees. Um, I think it's a fun rom-com that helps us identify a lot of the issues we see at the end of life. For many people, it's so scary to even think about it and they don't want to. And in various cultures, you know, have different ideas about even talking about it. For some, it may be superstitious to talk about things at the end of life. So we also want to respect, be respectful of that. Uh, but for those who do want to, you know, take the step and, and, and get to the nitty gritty of their end of life choices, that's why we're here today. And so that, that movie is kind of a fun way to identify a lot of the issues that we see uh, at the end of life. And so, I want to know from you, since I have a lawyer here, um, how my question, I'll go first and then we'll just go down the interdisciplinary panel. If someone does everything optimally correct, you know, they create their advanced directive and then they suddenly have a change in their um, mental capacity, can that be challenged by their family members? Um, or the real question is how can we protect folks who have put their advanced directive in place from it being challenged from outsiders down the road. You want me to take that from the lawyer perspective? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the, the simplest answer is no, it can't be modified. And that's the whole point of these is that when someone has a deeply held belief about the care that they want, whether it's end of life or mental health or any sort of circumstance where they can't make decisions for, for themselves. The whole point is to be able to create instructions that cannot be overridden by family or friends or others. And so part of the exercise for all of us that are engaged in this is helping family members understand that and saying, this is what your person uh, has told us they want sorry, we can't accept your request to do something different. 
we also need to educate other providers about the same thing because some of the time what happens is you get family members who literally go provider shopping for someone who's going to try and do what they want over the objections of of the patient in their advanced directives so i think it's it's a reminder that that a lot of education needs to be done um, to empower people, to empower allies of the patient, uh, as well as folks in the healthcare system to, to honor choices. Thank you. All right, well, let's just go on down the line. And I really wanna say one thing before um, I hand over the mic. Um, Helen, while we were talking about planning this day, she really inspired me to have this interdisciplinary panel because I really took it, you know, like, man, we're really not doing a good job as physicians, you know, talking about advanced care planning and things of that nature. And she really said, you know, we all have a role as an interdisciplinary team in bringing it up because I think you know, one person may think this person did it and the other person thinks this person did it. And we all have a role to play in that. And I love that. We recently had the annual assembly and it talked about being a transdisciplinary team, meaning we all do a little bit of each other's work so that the patient gets what they need. And so thank you for that, Helen. So I'll just popcorn over to you. Oh, I, I think it's so true that each discipline takes a role because we care for our patients, mind, body, and spirit. So they're really their advanced care planning needs to cover all those areas, mind, body, and spirit. So when I think from a nurse's perspective, what our role is in advanced care planning is to address a lot of the clinical questions that a patient and a caregiver, a family member might have. And if I had to boil it down to just a couple of things that I would want people to know, I would let people know that it's not permanent. You can change it. Your lives change, your opinions change, your beliefs might change, your finances, your decision maker, your healthcare provider might change, your insurance might change, diagnosis, and your advanced directive can change too. It's not chiseled in stone. You can always update it. You can retract it if you want to. And you can modify it any way you want. And I think that's important for people to know. I think they get scared that once that, that document's in place, that you can't do anything with it and you're stuck with that decision. And if I was talking to healthcare providers, other nurses that were assisting people with their advanced care planning, having those conversations, maybe helping them get those documents in place, I would remind them that a simple signature, either on a piece of paper or electronically, has a major impact psychologically, socially, communally, relationships, spiritually, for the person who's signing it, or if it's a decision maker signing a document, it has a major impact for those people. For us, it's something we do every day. You know, it, we breeze through it. We may have three or four people that we talk about advanced directives with each day. But for that one patient, that one caregiver, that's monumental. It's huge. It's, it's life altering, literally. So that's, that's what I would really try to help other healthcare professionals, other nurses who work with advanced care planning. I think it's important for them to remember that. Thank you, Helen. All right, let's go to, let's see, social worker chaplain, who's next? I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I love everything that Helen said. Um, and Nathan, it's so amazing being in community with you as the founder of National Healthcare Decision Day. Um, you know, I am the co-creator of the Death Deck and the EOL Deck, which are conversation tools to help people have these important conversations about end of life planning. And I think that a couple of the main things that I want to make sure people understand is that the document is just one piece of it. And often the advanced directive um, <clears throat> may not provide all the information that your loved ones really need to understand how to care for you at end of life. And so I always encourage people, 
it's so important to do the documents to complete your advanced directive and other estate planning and end of life preparation. But it's the conversations that really help give people the confidence to make healthcare decisions for you. People often don't even understand what you meant by the box that you checked. Um, <clears throat> and so having those conversations. The other thing I wanna say is um, when you're choosing your healthcare proxy, it's, it's not always in your best interest to choose a family member. It may be in your best interest to choose your spouse or your child, um, but it's not always. And I think people should be very thoughtful and intentional about who they choose for that. Um, I've had my own health issues and I watched my husband within the healthcare system and how he just deferred to the doctors and he didn't push them and he didn't ask questions. And it, it provided a lot of rich conversations for the two of I, I mean, excuse me, the two of us, to talk about that because I told him, I, I'm not going to choose you as my healthcare proxy if, if you don't have the confidence to ask questions from the medical team. Um, and so I think it's really important to be thoughtful about who you're designating and think about proximity. Are they close enough to be able to see you in your health condition and, and um, have the full scope of what's going on with you? Are they going to be overly emotional? Do they have any healthcare literacy and understanding? Um, again, this is always your choice and your option, but I think it's important to, to be thoughtful about it. And then lastly, make sure that your family knows who your healthcare decision maker is. Because let's say I do decide that my husband is not going to be my healthcare proxy anymore. I really need to let him know because he's going to come into the hospital setting thinking that he's the decision maker. And they're going to assume that as well, unless they have um, other information contrary to that. Hey, Dr. G, can I follow up on that with a very important point? Um, one of the things that we, all of us, I'm sure, struggle with is the notion that younger people don't need advanced care plans. Um, this is something for old, old folks with chronic issues or whatever. Um, but for anyone who is in a long-term unmarried relationship, you absolutely need an advanced care plan because in most states, your life partner will not be on the list of authorized decision makers. So it, it sort of goes the exact opposite way of what Lisa was saying in terms of who you're choosing is to be sure that you're not having somebody who's not the right person because you have not acted. So don't let the wrong decision maker be uh, appointed by default. That's fantastic. And Lisa, thank you for sharing that personal uh, piece. And we love the death deck and end of life deck um, is my favorite because it is the conversations and it gets folks to the nitty gritty of their choices. So thank you for creating that. We will have a link to that in the show notes. And also the other piece about surrogate stress. Um, in a recent podcast where we reviewed the annual assembly, we talked about the, the impact of being a surrogate decision maker on folks and not everyone can handle that stress and trauma. And I'll also have a link to an article about that in the show notes. So that's something to take into consideration um, to have someone who will advocate for you no matter what and stand up to those doctors <laughs> and those teams. So um, I think that's a perfect segue since we talked about conversations to the conversation project because we're also going to have links to the very important tools that help with those conversations. So Kate, how do you, what do you have to say about this day? Yeah, I think for me, it's important for folks to realize that these can be conversations about how you want to live your life through the end. Um, especially when we were talking about where people may feel uh, cultural norms, but not wanting to invite death, or this is disrespectful to bring it up. This idea that this is about honor and respect and I want to be sure, you know, you've made all your other major choices in life. And I just want to clarify that I would know what you would want because this is how you want to live your life through the end. And that we think these conversations are important early and often that a crisis is a really hard time to learn. And that's one of the benefits of having national healthcare decisions day every year to acknowledge this is something you can review on a regular basis because 
your decision maker may have changed, your wishes may have changed. Um, we have a lot of free conversation guides to try to make that easier for people in a variety of languages. Um, and for us, we really try to focus on what people's values are and not trying to get them to answer lots of hypothetical scenarios that could play out because we found that for some people, for lay people who don't have a lot of medical background, it can get real wonky real fast. But if you can start to talk about what are your values, what do you want to be sure somebody knows about you, what makes life worth you know, some extra time that can really help them. Um, and even just that phrasing of we'll figure this out together, not being alone, having to do it can be helpful. I feel like people listening now have a great icebreaker of listening to that. I was listening to this podcast. It made me realize I'm not so sure what you would want, or I just watched this movie Dr. G recommended, made me realize like I haven't told you some things. So I think the other thing is we often joke that we should have been the conversations project, that this isn't one sit down conversation where you're going to cover everything and you never get to revisit it, that this is kind of inviting dialogue more than once. Um, if you happen to see something in a movie or a TV show or something in the news, that could be a, an opening to talking about it. And that for those who I love Nathan's point that anybody listening today, you could choose on National Healthcare Decisions Day to have one conversation with someone. But if you also want to bring this to people where they live, work, pray, learn. We are happy to be a resource. We've got a lot of um, free community tools and just always so excited. Um, we often find that people receive this message better from people in their own sphere of influence. You don't need a lot of celebrities telling you what to do, but if you hear peers in your community doing this, that really makes a big difference. So would love to work with anybody who wants to bring this to their area. Awesome. Awesome. Well, since we talked about the surrogate stress, um, I'd like to go to um, Chaplain Jerry, just because you provide that support, not only to the hospice interdisciplinary teams, that's my favorite part of the chaplain's job, but also to the patients and families who are enduring these, these heavy issues and grief and all that, all that. So we'll go to you and then we'll go to our end of life doula and nurse Sharon. Sure. Well, thank you for having me on this episode. I am grateful to be here. One of the things that I run into quite often when it comes to advanced care planning are those patients who did not have an advanced care plan in place and the struggle that it causes for the families is immeasurable. They are uncertain about what to do because they haven't had any conversation with the patient so that the patient gave them any instructions. They find themselves, the, the, the family finds themselves lost and uncertain about any of this. And the emotional impact that it has on the family is overwhelming for them. And as chaplains and all of us as end of life professionals have to come alongside them and help them walk through this. And the emotional burden and the regret and the guilt that often goes along with this when there's not a plan in place is just immense. So we really encourage people to try to have that advanced care plan in place so that their family already knows. So their family doesn't have the kind of regret and guilt that often is present when there's not a plan. So one of the things I also wanna emphasize here is that we always wanna make sure that the, the big rocks are put in place, you know, the DNR or the, the POLST, or make sure that there's a, um, a medical power of attorney in place. We wanna make sure that the big rocks are there. But one of the things that I want to encourage is for people to also make sure that they have the, the smaller details in place. For instance, having a spiritual advanced care plan. And what I mean by that is people die the way that they live. And if they're a spiritual person, if they're a religious person, then they need to put into place some of the things that they would want at end of life. Do they want a particular religious ritual to be done for them before the, the death happens? Do they want a particular religious or spiritual ceremony done either before or after they die? They need to put this down. They need to communicate this to their family and to the rest of the end of life team that's gonna be working with them. So it's good to have the big rocks in place, but it's also important to have those 
we might say lesser details, but important details in place just as well. So I encourage them to make sure that, uh, that yes, you have the big rocks in place, but don't forget about all the other details as well. And uh, Kate, remind me what it is the, the religious um, offering that uh, Conversation Project has. It's, I think it's once a year, actually can be done at any time of the year for, for the churches yeah. to actually promote advanced care planning. We have the idea of a Conversation Sabbath. We're choosing a day where we have sample. We got a whole section on our site for faith leaders with sample sermons or different denominations, ways to tie this into that denomination. And I think for a lot of people, A, giving permission to think about this. Some of them are lighthearted. I remember a pastor in the Boston area who said, everybody in my congregation wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. So I got to talk to them about that. Or... Um, how to do pastoral care, different programming within the congregation, whatever that may look like. And again, across various denominations. Uh, for many people, hearing it from a faith leader is a much more trusted source of information. Rather, there's a lot of well-earned distrust of the healthcare system. And so it's not always best to hear from a healthcare provider or from a lawyer. We don't want people thinking this is only something medical or expensive to do. There's a lot of other uh, messengers who can help normalize this. Thank you for That's that. Great. Thank, thanks, Kate. Uh, and so we would encourage pastors and other faith leaders to use the the system that's already been put in place by the Conversation Project. They can go to the Conversation Project website and get all that information on how to do this and all the helps they need. And so that would be one another way for for this information to be to be pushed out. So, thank you, Dr. G. I will put a link to that in the show notes because I didn't know about that. Like I'm learning too. So uh, we will definitely promote that. Hello, co-author. Oh, happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, so for me, um, I do a lot of community service out there in underserved, un uh, marginalized communities um, because I'm finding that you know, no one wants to talk about this. When I get calls as an end of life doula or I'm contacted, it's always in a crisis mode. You know, they're trying to react to something that's going on. So when I'm out there in the community, I actually do a monthly health fair community where I use all the tools, death deck, end of life deck, uh, conversation project tools. And I find myself just pulling from my tool bag um, just to meet that particular person where they are. Um, so of course the conversation is difficult, difficult, difficult. Um, and so that's what I'm about. I'm trying to spark ways to come up with ideas to spark that conversation, just to have that conversation. So again, back to the health fair that I attend um, monthly, you know, we're all set up with our little boots or whatever. Um, so when I first started going, of course they would go by my table once they found out what I was there. So um, I had to try to come up with a different approach. So I've kind of narrowed my approach down to two questions. And those are, does your loved one know what you want at the end of your life? And do you know what your loved one's wishes are at the end of their life? Um, so I find out I get a little bit, little bit more dialogue when I just pose those two questions, which kind of opens it up for me to kind of, you know, empower and really stress the importance of having these end of life conversations, having these documents and things um, in place. So um, I'm actually going to my health fair tomorrow and I'm looking forward because we have national health care decisions today coming up. I'm going to have all of my tools out there again. Um, conversation projects tools are amazing. Um, so the communities that I serve, they are really um, rely heavily on their, on their faith, their churches. Um, so I also work with trying to get into churches and, um, speaking to uh, those members, um, you know, hearing it from their pastors or whatever, um, they're kind of a little bit more open and receptive to 
to having those conversations. Um, so in addition, I also facilitate uh, workshops, end of life workshops, um, again, just to get this conversation started. And I think that it is so, so very important. Um, again, because I'm getting these phone calls, I'm being contacted when, you know, things have not in, been in place. They're utilizing uh, hospice benefits um, much later on. Uh, they're wondering what can they do at this point. Um, you know, there's a lot of discord within the families. Who, you know, there is no healthcare proxy. Um, so just getting out there, really stressing the importance of, uh, you know, advanced care planning, end of life planning. Um, I decided to start my uh, end of life doula practice again because of the regret that I would hear from family members, um, you know, wishing they had utilized services sooner, wishing they had had things in place, um, which is really heartbreaking. Um, you know, kind of tucks at, tucks at your heart when, you know, you're, you're in the midst of something um, and, you know, you could have had some things in place to kind of prevent some of that anxiety, some of that angst. Um, so, yeah, that, that's Thank what I'm you. getting all of that out there and uh, empowering those out there in that community, letting them know how important this is. Thank you so much for all the education you do in the community. Um, and that's at our San Diego YMCA, good old yeah. YMCA. Yes. So thank you for all that you do in the community and your training of end of life doulas and being on the NHPCO end of life doula council. It's really, really important work for patients and families to have that service. Um, you know, when they, especially, you know, if they're on hospice or whatever's going on. So thank you for that. So now um, let's talk about the pulse. We'll, we'll switch on over to Christina pulse specialist. So tell us about that role. And maybe if you have any comments about, I think I heard about a national pulse going on. So just kind of enlighten us on that and the nitty gritty. Yeah. So I am part of the San Diego Coalition for Compassionate Care. We offer monthly pulse trainings and our target audience is really um, clinicians, doctors, anyone that's having these regular conversations. Our other role is to normalize death because as a society, we don't want to talk about it. We think if we talk about it, it's not going to happen. So I'd love to go. I, I love talking about it. I talk about it all day long. Like, yay. Um, because I think what I see being frontline all the time is healthcare is still so crisis driven. They have the crisis. I get involved. And then, you know, they're trying to decide if they want to put a feeding tube in or they don't. And, and the lack of education around like what actually a feeding tubes are, what types there are still always amazes me with clinicians and social workers and, and doctors and stuff like that. So I really sit down and say, Hey, let's break this down. What does this look like? Um, an example, I had a wife one time husband was end stage Parkinson's disease. And she was trying to decide if they wanted to put in a feeding tube. And I sat down with her and I said, Hey, if he could be here right now and he could really tell you what he thought, you know, what would he do? And she said, Oh, he would have never wanted that. And I said, well, then he answered that question for you. And she looked at me and she's like, nobody told me that like that. He did. You're right. Like it was this huge relief to her. And I think just having those conversations and educating them really is where I see the impact because like you guys have said, I get there, they're in complete crisis. We're trying to find finances to get them placed or how to get caregiving in place. And if we can meet them way earlier down the line and say, that's great, you wanna stay home, but what does that look like? What is the cost of that? And how are you going to have that happen? Because one out of every two women are gonna need care at the end of life. And one out of every three men, you know? So how do we put that in place to help really get you there and make sure that you're living the life that you want. Wow. 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 Thank you for that. And so I'm glad you mentioned the finances and caregiving and that, because that segues, segues perfectly into Christine and her expertise. You know, we often see people when, when they come on the hospice, for instance, you know, they're getting out of the hospital, they have to be placed. Maybe they don't have the finances for, you know, the assisted living, maybe they have it for the board and care, you know, just crisis everywhere. They, they have to sell the house. They have to do this. Just all this stuff is, is happening when this 
event happens in their life. And so people are not ready for it. And so how can folks prepare for that in advance? I heard about long-term care insurance. I'm no expert at all. We all know that Medicare pays for the hospice benefit, the health care you receive at the end of life. Hospice is health care at the end of life at your home, wherever you call home, just so we're clear about that. And it's a six month benefit. Um, it can be longer, but we do not want to wait until the last six hours of your life to get the health care that you need at the end of life. We want to plan ahead. And so you can look at some old episodes and get more information on that, but I have to say it here. So Christine, let's talk about the that piece, the financial and all that preparation and everyone else Feel free to jump in because we're going to be landing this plane uh, for this live stream uh, after she talks. So let's just get into that. Sure. So again, thanks, Dr. G, for having me. So I'm Christine Swisher. I am a licensed agent and I specialize in Medicare insurance. And that's really kind of what sparked was just learning about um how down the road your Medicare choices can really affect the type of care that you receive. Um, but what is most, you know, um, really when it hits home is um, watching loved ones that do need care, whether it be accident or end of life. Um, but as we all know, sometimes it takes a long time to get to the end of life point. But uh, so, yeah, so I often, just like Sharon had mentioned previously, I often, and many of you, um, I meet with um, love ch adult children or love caregivers that are making decisions, healthcare decisions for their parents or loved ones. And so they are truly facing decisions um, and they are needing to make some Medicare changes. Um, but if they are not, um, and they're bringing those loved ones back into their homes, um, we all know that Medicare, yes, it does pay for the hospice, but Medicare actually only pays for 20 days in the skilled nursing facility. After that, you are on your own. And it clearly states that uh, in the Medicare and You guidebook. And what I have found is that when people are going through these um, challenging crisis or they've been a caregiver in this um, for quite some time, they often say, often say, they don't want to put this on their family members. They don't want their kids or maybe they don't have kids. Maybe they were never married and they never had children. Um, or maybe, you know, sadly, their children are, um, they had three or four kids. None of the kids are around to help support them. And so um, whoever is the caregivers, it really sparks um you know, what am I going to do down the road? Because this is something that you're going to have to face. And so I help them make those decisions, um, choosing insurance wisely, but also planning for long term. Um, and how are you going to pay for those long term care costs? Because uh, that's definitely not going on sale anytime soon. And so I help people across the country. I'm here in San Diego. Um, but uh, I feel very blessed to be able to just educate people. So what can folks do ahead of time? Um, you know, if just to kind of plan for the financial piece of potentially needing care? Sure. So the biggest thing is to one, um, really meet with a long-term care specialist. Um, sometimes, oftentimes well, people say, well, I looked into that years ago and it was just way too expensive. Well, if you're not working with a specialist who knows all of the different plans and especially a plan that will meet your need and work with your budget, so that's the most important part. If you have a budget to allocate those funds to long-term care insurance, then, you know, you also have to qualify based on your health. So the younger you are, the healthier you are, the best, most affordable plan that the person can secure. The other thing is, um, 
there are clients that um, there are plans that you can get insured as early as 18 because um, sometimes the parents, when they go through this, because they've been caregiving for their own uh, parents, they say, you know, do you, what is the youngest I could get my child um, a policy? Maybe they're going to college and they're going to play a sport where they could be faced with some type of accident or illness where they would need care. I've had many clients reach out um, and, and wanting to secure that. So um, you, you do have to medically qualify. But if you, um, let's say, depending on the state, there are some plans that that are considered short-term care insurance, and that can cover you for a small window of time. And typically that's about a year. All right. Well, thank you for that. We have covered a lot of ground here um, and I am just so grateful. I hope everyone can take something away and I'll leave uh, the final words with the founder of National Healthcare Decisions Day uh, to kind of wrap this thing up and Well, and thanks. Home. Oh, it, it is always so amazing um, for me to, to be a member of a panel like this, where, as I said, I created this thing years ago, had no idea what it was going to blossom into. One of the absolute best and absolute worst parts of it is that it is so big that I don't even know all the activities that are going on. And that's just, it's frustrating because I wish I did, but it's really cool to know that all these folks are out there and we could have triple this panel with another set of experts that are doing great things. So um, whoever you are, keep doing what you're doing. If you happen to be a member of the public, you can do something too. Go ask your faith leader. Go ask the director of the assisted living facility where your mom lives or your dad lives and ask them to give you information on this topic because it's important. So this is not just experts talking to the public. It's you guys pulling from us experts as well. So um, go out there, do something, uh, make a difference. We're all making a difference. And uh, so thank you for convening this great group, Dr. G. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's my hope that maybe we have a map and everyone registers and it's like lit up um, and everyone's participating in every state. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. I wish I could. I had a round of applause button. I respect you all. I'm grateful for the things that you do. And everyone listening, go ahead and take care of those things with your advanced directive and your family members, your parents, your spouses, and let's have better experiences at the end of life. So thank you, everyone. Peace. This is season thank two you. premiere. Thank you, Mark. Um...